So this first lecture will be more or less just a broad introduction to the data mining, what, what this is about, uh, and kind of a brief overview of the basic concepts that we will go through later in the, in the rest of the course. So just to give you an overview of, of the contents that we are planning, so this first lecture is about the introduction, then we will talk about decision trees, algorithms, we will talk about neural networks and support vector machines, we will talk about interestingness and association rules, visualization, data knowledge representation, and then one final lecture on anomaly detection and unsupervised learning. Because most of what we will be talking about is, is about supervised learning, but we want to touch some, some other uh, concepts as well. Uh, uh, so excuse me, one initial question. Mm -hmm. Will these slides be available for us later on? Yes, I will, I will make them available. Mm -hmm. So okay. we, we have an interactive tool that you will also get access to eventually and uh, there you can find the uh, slides, recordings and also assignments and things like that. Mm -hmm. right. So we, we are just building all of those things so it will probably take some time before everything is in place but I, I will make sure that you can get access to the slides and the video uh, as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And of course, uh, and any time if, if you have questions about what I'm saying and so on, just feel free to interrupt and, and ask them. So just to give a brief overview of the data mining, what, what this is about, and there are of course a lot of different definitions, but it's basically about ways to discover patterns in the data. So you want to find different ways of finding useful patterns in the data. And of course, the the definition of useful is quite broad and a little bit fuzzy. It's not clear what it means. So people have tried to make it a little bit more concrete by saying, well, they should be non-trivial, implicit, unexpected, previously unknown, and so on. So on one hand, the idea behind data mining is very much centered on the, the person who is going to learn something. So it's, it's quite subjective uh, area and it's a little bit difficult to formalize all of the aspects of it, but there is of course uh, quite a number of, of concrete tasks and, and concrete evaluation measures and, and so on. And we will go through a number of those, some of those today, some later in the course. And if we think about why data mining is so popular right now, the, this goes back to this old necessity is the mother of invention. And people have been saying that we are drowning in data but starving for knowledge. And the idea is basically that we are, as human race, we are creating a lot more data than we have ever before in our history. But to actually get something useful out of this data is becoming harder and harder. So we need automotive tools to help us with that. And in that context, one way of looking at data mining is that it's just one of the many buzzwords. And if you think about different words that mean more or less the same thing, sometimes with different contexts, so sometimes uh, subsets of it, if you think of things like knowledge discovery, data analytics, business intelligence, decision support, machine learning, all of those things, different people use in different, uh, in different meanings, but they have at least a very big overlap with, with the data mining. On the other hand, if you think of the somewhat related fields, which are actually quite different, those would be things like search, query processing, or deductive expert systems. They all focus on knowledge as well, but they don't focus on this discovery of knowledge. So in that sense, those are not equivalent to, to data mining. So to continue on this idea of what is, what is the reason behind data mining uh, becoming so popular right now, uh, people talk about this data gap in, in many different settings. And there are different ways of, of looking at this gap. So you can talk about the, uh, for example, comparing the easy to use versus difficult to use data. So if you compare relational data to unstructured data, all of those graphs kind of show you how the data, the amount of available data grows over time. But the important thing is it's not only about the amount of data that changes, it's also the type of data that we are working with. 
that changes. So, for example, we are getting a lot more unstructured data right now, a lot more text data, a lot more images data, and taking advantage of that is much harder than taking advantage of, for example, relational data. Another uh, kind of... You have a question. Mm -hmm. what, what is meant by unstructured and, uh, versus uh, re relational data? Mm -hmm. So relational data is data in which you have each, each, let's say, number has assigned meaning. So you would have, for example, a table, and there you would have uh, speed, power, uh, fuel consumption, and, and so on. So you would know what each of the numbers means, and they are in a nice, easy to understand way, in a sense. Unstructured data would be something like images or free text, websites, and so mm -hmm. on where okay, yeah. uh, for any given symbol, its meaning is not obvious because it depends on, on other things around it, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are other ways of looking at it. So there is a time to make decisions, shortens why the amount of data that you need to take into account uh, becomes bigger. Uh, the relation between relevant and irrelevant data is, is changing. We, it, if you look back, let's say, 100 years, you would only write down things which are important. Today, you write down everything. So there is a lot more irrelevant data which is still stored and has to be somehow sifted out. So there is a lot of different ways in which you can look at it, but in general, there are two major factors for, for data mining to become so important, and that's the amount of data and the type of data uh, that, that we need to handle. So, if we think about some examples of whether something is data mining or not, uh, if you think of looking up phone number in phone directory, uh, is this a data mining or is it not? Uh, what do you think? Any guesses? It's not data mining because yeah, it's trivial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah. that's not data mining. Uh, if you want to find out that certain names are more prevalent at certain U.S. locations, so for example, O'Brien is more popular in Boston area, uh, is that data mining or, or not? Mm -hmm. That would be data mining. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that could be data mining. Now, if you... Find, frame this question as finding out which names are most popular in Boston, that's not data mining anymore, right? So if you know what you are looking for, it's not really data mining. But if you say, well, I want to find certain relations and you don't know, you, the, you want to automatically discover that, the, that there is difference in, uh, in popularity, that, that it becomes data mining. Uh, how about querying a web for information about Amazon. Is that data mining? You're searching for a specific name and topic you know, or in a structured uh, environment, aren't you? So it would be no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if we are just looking for a word Amazon, then not really. How about if we want to find the documents or separate the documents between Amazon Rainforest and Amazon.com, would that make it data mining? I would say yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So again, if the problem was simpler in a sense of you would want to find the occurrences of both word Amazon and Rainforest, then it wouldn't be data mining. But if you want to figure out if a document is about, about Amazon Rainforest, is a much more complex task than just looking for the for the word rainforest. So if you really want to do it well, you need to do some form of, of data mining. So that, that's kind of the basic, basic idea. And if you try to formalize it a little bit more, basically data mining is an algorithmic process. So you want to something that's, that's possible to automate. Uh, you want to take data as input and you want to get some kind of pattern as output. And now the interesting question is what kind of patterns we are looking for, because there is a lot of different potential outputs from the data mining process. 
So we could be looking for things like descriptions or abstractions of data. So we want to do to summarize a document that would be data mining. You could look for classification or association rules for rules that tell you that certain things happen together. You can look for clusters or outliers or deviations in the data. You can look for different kind of sequential patterns like causality or to do abductive reasoning. You can look for regression or you can try to do change point detection. All of those things, those are different kinds of patterns that you could be interested in. And in general, uh, yes? A uh, question, uh, what, what is abductive reasoning? Uh, so abductive reasoning is reasoning about possible causes. So this is what you would do, for example, in diagnostics, when you say that, well, my engine doesn't work, what could be the possible causes for it? Uh, and then uh, okay. Understood. figure it out. Mm -hmm. So for all of those different patterns that you can be interested in, you would need to design different methods to find those. So what is interesting is that from the same kind of data, you can potentially find different kinds of patterns. Uh, and I think that that's a very useful property. But the key concept in all of this is about discovery. This is all about finding something new. Uh, but what is important is also that the data mining, that there is kind of no wisdom in it. So they, data mining algorithms can discover new patterns, but they will not be able to apply them in any, any way. So, for example, they can find the relation between buying diapers and beer. Uh, and I don't know if you are familiar with, with this, but that was one of the uh, kind of uh, high-profile first success stories behind data mining. Uh, when people started looking at uh, sales data in, in, a, in a supermarket, they basically noticed that, especially Friday night, there was surprisingly high correlation between buying diapers and beer. And it turns out that okay. young fathers who are sent to buy diapers, they just also have to buy beer to survive this uh, traumatic experience. Uh, and that was a very, very interesting fact because that really was one of the first cases of finding something new. It, it makes sense if you start thinking about it, but it's really something that nobody knew about. So you can use data mining to find such relations, but what's the next step? What do you do once you have figured it out? That, that's a different question, because as a store manager, you could be interested in putting those two uh, together so that, uh, first of all, you reinforce this tendency, so actually people buy beer together with those diapers, and also you make your customers happy because they don't have to walk too far. Or you could decide that it's actually better to put them far away so that people have to work throughout the whole store and maybe they will buy something else on the way. Uh, so to figure out between those two things that you cannot do just using data mining. Here, you either need to add some more data about kind of the, the uh, psychology of uh, of buyers or you need to try to do different experiments and so on. So it's important to understand that there is some limits to, to what you can do with data mining. Uh, and in general, data mining will tell you about things that happened, but it will not tell you about possible things that could happen in, in the future if you change something compared to, to how the past looked like. And so you can use data mining to kind of help to make plans, but Data mining will not make those plans for you. And if you think about those kind of early, early successes, so the things that, that happened I mean, somewhere in, let's say, 50s or 60s uh, last year, uh, there have been a number of, of uh, uh, things that, that actually became so popular that now almost all of the industries is based on it. So, for example, bank loan is not done by people anymore, pretty much anywhere in the world. It's all about machine learning and data mining. And this has evolved into other things. So insurance is now being done automatically. Different kinds of loyalty programs are managed automatically. All of those things are pretty much pure uh, machine learning data mining. Uh, 
another very kind of uh, popular or, or high profile success story was about travel behavior patterns. So when the airlines started changing the prices for their tickets based on different factors, that was based on data mining and that has changed the, the industry quite a bit. Uh, and now it's not only the, the airplanes, now it's hotels who are doing it and, and so on. So there is a lot of, uh, uh, in a lot of industries in which the goal is to discover people behavior, uh, you use data mining. The diapers and beer example started with supermarkets, but those kinds of approaches have also became quite popular in many other areas. So uh, you use similar techniques today to do website planning, uh, to do genome analysis, drug design. All of those things are based on somewhat similar association rules and, and, and so on. And you also started doing quite a bit of data mining in actual science. So when you look at astronomy or physics, a lot of the data that we collect today in, in those areas, it's too much to really be, be analyzed by hand. So you need to be using data mining to, to do those, those kinds of things. So there is quite a bit of, of uh, uh, work that went into this and quite a few industries that, that have been changed by those kinds of things. If we look at maybe more, more recent success stories, so of course marketing is, is one of the areas where people are putting a lot of data mining. So figuring out how much to spend on marketing, what channels to use and so on. Uh, and today you can basically start doing it uh, on a very fine grained level. So something like zip code level. So uh, you can say that at different parts of a city, you can do marketing in different ways uh, based on the type of population that tends to, tends to live there. Uh, if you want to model credit risk, that's something that, again, started maybe in the 50s, but today people have noticed that you actually can do it based not only on financial data. Uh, today, people started using uh, mobile networks, tele telecom industry started looking into this and turns out that if you look at the uh, mobile, the, the cell phone use behaviors, that's a very good predictor for whether somebody will uh, pay their credit, pay back their uh, debt or not. Kind of interesting. Uh, in a different industry, if you look at the Coca-Cola orange juice, turns out they are doing a lot of data mining because you cannot get the same types of oranges everywhere around the world. They have identified like 600 different types of oranges and they use data mining in order to make sure that regardless of what type of orange you start with, you will always end up with exactly the same orange juice. Uh, that sounds kind of interesting. Uh, and there is a lot of work world on the personalized shopping. So there are some stores which put RFID tags on clothes and they will actually display video descriptions and some complementary offerings based on the clothes you try on. So you go to a store, you try on a number of clothes, and they will build a profile based on this and give you suggestions uh, for what, what else you might want to buy and, and so on. So those, those kinds of approaches have, have started to, to really enter all the different areas of, of our lives. Uh, so if we kind of move away a little bit from marketing maybe and, and start talking more about the, the science, if we look at scientific definitions of, of data mining, there is a couple of them. Uh, you can look at non-trivial extraction of implicit, previously unknown, potentially useful information from data. That, that's one. Automated extraction of patterns representing knowledge. Uh, discovering patterns in the data automatic or semi-automatic. Patterns must be meaningful. Finding hidden information in a database. Uh, so there is a lot of different ways in which you can try to, to phrase it, but again, it's all about finding something which is in the data, but it's hidden, it's not obvious. So 
obvious patterns are not data mining. If it's not in the data, then of course you cannot find it. So it has to be something that, that's hidden. Uh, and if you think about how this can actually be done, uh, there are different ways of kind of formalizing the, the process of data mining, but it basically always starts with some kind of data sources. So you need to identify what type of data you are interested in and what type of data you want to be working with, what data you have available, and so on. Once you have your data sources, you want to do some kind of exploration. So you want to look at this data, try to understand it, try to see if, if it really is the type of data you wanted, if there are some uh, errors in the data, something is missing, and so on. Just want to get kind of an overview of the data. Once you have done this, you do the modeling. So you want to create some kind of model or description of this data that you will be able to use later. And that can be, for example, uh, a classification model or a prediction model. Uh, and I will talk more about this, this particular uh, later on. And once you have built this model and you evaluated it and, and you are happy with the, the performance, then you want to deploy it. So you basically want to figure out how are you going to be making decisions based on the output of this model. So if the model will be predicting whether a customer buys something or not, how will you use this model to guide your marketing strategy or, or something else? This is the kind of general, uh, general idea. And if you think about the kind of difference or what is new about data mining, if you think about reporting and analysis, that's very much about what has happened in the past. So you look at the past data and you want to uh, visualize or explain this past data. And the data mining, the whole idea behind it is to try to answer questions like, why did it happen? So what kind of patterns you can see in the past that you can use then to predict the future? Uh, and it's all partially why this data mining is always a kind of semi-automatic process where you need to have a human in the loop because we, we don't really have computer systems that will be capable of doing it on its own. Uh, and one way of looking at it is that you want data mining to move higher in this kind of knowledge pyramid. So if you look at this information hierarchy, at the very bottom you have the data. So, so this is the could be, for example, sensor information or history of uh, sales or something like this. And one, on one level higher, you can transform this data info, into information. So information is data which is organized in some kind of useful way, uh, whatever, whatever this is. And historically, that would be done by, by people. But now the idea is that you would want to make those transformations at least semi-automatically. And then as a next step from information, you want to be building knowledge. So knowledge is the information which has been understood and integrated. So once you have combined several sources of information and you understand them, then you have gained some kind of knowledge. Uh, and the final step here is wisdom which is distilled knowledge that then you can use to make decisions so to know something is, is one thing but then the next step is to actually be able to use this knowledge to make better decisions so this kind of uh, knowledge uh, pyramid that that predates data mining that's about how people uh, do their reasoning but then the data mining strives to reproduce this, uh, at least partially in an automatic way. So if we look at the data mining process, how this, how this actually should happen, we want to get from the data to knowledge. So as, as we talked about, that there is several different steps that you, you need to do. So you usually start with the data cleaning, because it turns out that when you collect data, there is usually uh, quite a few problems with it, so you cannot just directly use this data. You need to uh, clean it, you need to remove uh, erroneous values, you need to do something about missing values, and so on. 
Then you usually need to do data integration because it turns out that all the data you need is not in one place. You need to uh, combine several different sources. Then you need to do data selection because you need to focus on a particular task. You have a particular goal. So you want to throw away the data which is not relevant for what you're trying to do. Then you do the modeling step. You evaluate your models. And if it works the way you want, then you can say that you have extracted some amount of knowledge. Uh, so the, those first steps you would usually do in a database. Then you would create some kind of data warehouse. Uh, then you would pick a smaller part of this warehouse which is relevant for your particular task. And then you discover the patterns. And the tricky thing, of course, is that once you do this, it usually <laughs> turns out that the results you are getting are not as good as you want to. So you need to kind of go back and fix the mistakes that you have done in, in different kind of stages. So this is a very broad overview of the, of the data mining process. Uh, and we try to go a little bit deeper into, into how you would want to do it. The first very important step in, a, in data mining is to actually understand the application domain. So this is one of the biggest challenges that uh, data mining experts have, is that it's not really enough to become an expert in the data mining itself. When you apply data mining to a particular area, you need to at least a little bit understand that area, because otherwise you will not be able to, feel, to, to determine if the patterns you are discovering are actually useful or not. So you need to have a somewhat clear idea of what your application is about and what kind of task you actually want to solve. Once you have this, this idea, you want to create a data set which is relevant for this particular task. So you want to figure out what kind of data you need, what kind of data is available, how to organize it, so that it's, it's possible to, uh, to work with it. Then you do the data cleaning and pre-processing. And one of the challenges is that this step is it's a very boring one because it doesn't sound like you're actually achieving much. But it's also one which, which takes a lot of time uh, because there is a lot, of, a lot of different ways in which the data can, can be problematic when the bad quality of the data is, is usually one of the biggest challenges. And dealing with that takes a lot of time. So, so this, is, this is something that's important to understand, that there is usually a lot of uh, effort that goes into uh, those kinds of, uh, of challenges. Uh, can you give an example of what cleaning means in this uh, sense? So in most cases, it, it depends very much on what, what kind of data you are working with. But it's all about removing impossible uh, data. So removing values which are impossible, removing sequences which, which are impossible. Mm -hmm. And this, this comes back pretty much from the... All of, all of the time we, we are collecting data, we are never collecting it in a, uh, in a perfect way. And especially since data mining is about uh, using large data sets, it means that... So let's say on, that you log, log the data from a car, for example, if, if you have a clogged distance sensor, for example, that can be a, a case where you have to remove some of those values. Example. Yes, exactly. So broken sensors, communication errors, all of those things lead to data which doesn't really uh, correspond to reality. Uh, and the problem is that such data can be very problematic for, uh, for analysis because it, it will skew uh, a lot of the distributions in, in different ways. And it's generally not easy to figure out when the data is good and when the data is bad. So, so that's why it takes a lot of time. And the obvious cases, like if, if you have, uh, let's say you are working with vehicles and you have vehicle speed of nine, 999 kilometers, that's quite easy to remove. So obviously that's, that's bad value, doesn't make any sense. Uh, but there are many cases when this is not so obvious and, and that's what, what takes so much time. Mm -hmm. Then the next step is you want to 
select the actual task that you want to do. So you want to decide if you want to do classification or regression or association rules and so on. Because usually for any kind of business goal that you might have, there are many different approaches that you can try to solve it or many different types of insights that you could try to investigate. So you need to pick one uh, and, and decide what you want to actually do. Uh, once you do this, then you would pick a particular algorithm and in most cases this will be some form of machine learning uh, and you will apply it to the data that you have prepared. And if you talk to different people, different people have uh, different ideas about the relation between machine learning and data mining uh, and, and so on. Not everybody will agree with, with my view on it, but in, in my, uh, in the, the way I'm, I like to describe it is that the machine learning is the part where you have your data set, you know what you want to do, and then you apply a particular algorithm, could be random forest, could be deep learning, could be support vector machine, could be clustering, any of those algorithms, and you get some kind of result. So this is one step in the whole data mining process. Uh, once you apply the machine learning, this will give you some kind of patterns. Again, it could be classifier or clusters or anything else. Then the next step is to evaluate those results. So you want to figure out if the result you have gotten is good enough, if this actually uh, achieves your goals. And then once you are happy with, with the result, then you can actually start using the discovered knowledge. So that, that's also an important step which a lot of people kind of forget about is that the data mining itself, that doesn't really solve any problems. Uh, data mining is about getting new knowledge, but then you need to think about how are you going to apply this new knowledge to actually get something better. So I have been... a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, at what part do you, um, I mean, if you have a large data set with different kind of scenarios, mm -hmm. and some are scenarios that doesn't happen that often, and more are uh, common, mm -hmm. how do you, where do you do the, um, you want, you want your, your data mining process or machine learning, you want it to be learned evenly, so it doesn't focus on like one scenario because it's mostly represented in the uh, in the data mm -hmm. at yeah, what so. stage do you do this kind of proportion dividing up the proportions and how how do you, what what is like the what are the proportions basically <laughs> i mean how that, how do you another, weigh mm -hmm. once it, sorry yeah i that's, think you got in my my point mm -hmm. yeah i i get it so there's a very interesting question and unfortunately there is no simple answer to it uh Depending on what you want to do and, and kind of how deeply you want to go into it and, and how difficult this particular problem is, you might try to do it in different steps. So you could try to handle this in the data cleaning step. You could, for example, uh, either split your data into several problems or you could do some kind of balancing techniques and so on. So you could basically try to say that the the fact that there are different scenarios and some of those are very uncommon, that's, uh, uh, in a sense, imperfection in the data. And you would want to try to fix this imperfection in different ways before you go further in the data mining task. Uh, mm. You could try to address this in the selecting of data mining task step, where you would actually kind of explicitly target different scenarios separately. You could try to handle this with machine learning algorithms because there are some algorithms which are better in such scenarios than, than others. So you could say that mm. uh, you don't worry about this, but you will need to pick an algorithm which is robust against such problems. Uh, so, so there is a number of different, different ways of handling it and it's, uh, neither of those is generally the best. So uh, either you would need mm try a couple and, and see which works, or you kind of need to... The, the problem is that data mining is still, despite the fact that uh, we are trying to teach it, it's still a lot of more 
uh, art than science. So you need to have mm. quite a bit of experience and, uh, and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, also a typical case, for instead for an automotive area, is like if you have, let's say, situations which are dangerous, basically mm -hmm. hazardous, mm -hmm. either for the person or the equipment or whatever. It's 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 hard to get those data points, but they are very re relevant to get the uh, to get the mm -hmm. uh, knowledge or like the outcome that you would like. Yes. So, yeah. So in this particular case, the bad news is that. Nobody has yet figured out how to do it. All the companies mm. who are trying to do autonomous driving, they are struggling with this very much, and uh, we don't know how to solve this yet. Uh, that this is a very good example, and but it's also a very extreme example uh, of something that right now remains unsolved. Yeah, that, that's actually one of the biggest challenges in the autom automotive industry right now, and in, in the self-driving cars, is that in order to guarantee safety in those very rare circumstances they would need to do so much testing that it's completely invisible and and right now yeah. really nobody has any idea how to how to avoid that mm -hmm. yes okay mm -hmm. good uh, so uh in the data mining, there, there's also a number of kind of related disciplines. So the data mining is, is not kind of on its own. It builds on a lot of different different areas. So one of the important aspects is, of course, the database technology, because data mining is built on large amounts of data, and you need to store it somehow. Uh, data mining combines a lot of approaches from machine learning, statistics, and pattern recognition. So all of those. Uh, domains are very important. Uh, there is a lot of algorithmic work. Uh, a lot of what you would want to do in data mining is uh, has very high computational complexity, so you need to spend quite a bit of time trying to optimize those, those different things. Uh, visualization is very important because once you discover some kind of knowledge, it's not really useful unless people can understand the output. So different ways of visualizing things are, are very important. So it, in general, the, the data mining is a very interdisciplinary area. So uh, there is a lot of, a lot of overlap with, uh, with other uh, domains. And if you think about what is the, the kind of core of data mining, all of the data mining is more or less about finding a good model that fits the data. And the model can be very different ways, but still you want to have a good way of fitting the data. And the challenges that for different tasks, for different kinds of patterns that you want to find, you need different criteria that lets you choose one model over another. Uh, and on one hand, all of this is based on ways to compare different pieces of data. So if you would have uh, two different images or two different customers, you want to have different ways of measuring how similar they are to each other. Because all of the data mining is about finding out good groups of, let's say, customers who behave in a similar way. If you can find good groupings like this, then you can use it to predict future behaviors and so on. The task is, of course, that or the challenge is that those comparisons are often very difficult because not all the information is equally relevant. And when you talk about, let's say, buying behavior for customers in supermarkets, uh, many of the uh, many of the features of of the customers are not really that important and figuring out which uh, which factors are the main driving forces behind the buying behavior that's the that's the very tricky thing uh, but if you think of it there are two main types of models so one is so-called predictive models where the goal is to infer unknown values based on known data so you basically have a partial description of the data and you want to uh, fill in the gaps in this description uh, based on the uh, 
based on the training data that you had. And the other type of models are descriptive models, which kind of identify and expose patterns in the data. So in this case, you don't focus on the unknown data, but you rather focus on summarization and comparisons on different ways to uh, describe those data items. Uh, so if you think about what has been the most, uh, most useful and most successful uh, approaches, many of those are based on supervised learning paradigm. And the challenge with supervised learning is that it actually requires usually quite a large training set. Uh, so in many cases, it's difficult to get such large sets of data. So there has been a lot of research, for example, on what can you do when you have a data which, is, which has some supervi supervised labels, but they are not very trustworthy. Uh, also, if you look at the kind of more typical machine learning research, this usually assumes that your quality criterion is known. So you know exactly what you are trying to optimize. So you could try to have high accuracy or F-score or ARIA under rock curve, a number of different measures of it. But when you look at it from the data mining perspective, it's often that the actual uh, problem that you are trying to solve doesn't match a particular quality criterion very well. Uh, also, the, the question is, what kind of data should be used for final analysis? Because in many cases, you have some, so you, you would do this kind of data mining pilot project, and in this pilot, you could have uh, some amount of data, but then it would turn out that when you try to deploy this kind of uh, the, this, this, the solution, it turns out that in this research or pilot project, you had access to more data than what you actually have available in the production systems, and then you cannot really do it. Or it turns out that the way the data has been selected for this uh, pilot project was in some way biased. You have picked the easiest cases, and when you try to do it more broadly, things don't, don't work so well. So there is a number of kind of challenges uh, related to uh, how to actually take the uh, small scale data mining projects and, and turn them into, into bigger scale. So th those are things that it, that's important to, to think about. Will you actually be able to uh, uh, scale up the solutions that, that you are working on? Uh, there's a, one kind of interesting, I think, direction I, I wanted to talk about, which is maybe not so, so much uh, uh, related to, to industry applications, but if you think about how the, the concept of science has changed over the years, like what does it actually mean to discover new knowledge? Uh, if you just, just go back to like, be, until let's say 17th century, we had what we called empirical science. And back then, the science was about just observing and writing down things. So you would measure things, write it down, and that was getting new knowledge. It's only in the, uh, let's say, between 1600s to 1950s, uh, we started talking about theoretical science. So the theoretical science was based on the theoretical models. So we would build a model of how the world should behave. We, we said, we have a certain level of understanding of the world around us. And we think that the world behaves this way. And then we will, based on those models, design experiments to check if our models are correct or not. So in a sense, we would use models and experiments to generalize our understanding. It was not only about observations, but it was about finding patterns in those observations and then doing more experiments to see if those patterns will hold in the future. Uh, and that's kind of the, the 
baseline of what we would think the, the scientific method is about. We say, this is our hypothesis, this is what we expect will happen, and then we perform the experiment and we either, uh, it either conforms to our hypothesis or we need to come up with a different hypothesis. Uh, but turns out that there are, you, you can go farther beyond that because let's say around 1950s, we started talking about computational science. And basically in every branch of science, we now have the computational version. We have computational biology, we have computational linguistics. Wherever you look, you have the computational version. And that basically means that we have reached stage at which the models that we are building are too complicated for us to understand and are too complicated for us to design new experiments. We need uh, computers to help us with, with dealing with this. Generally, that means using different kinds of simulations. Uh, and then some people started saying that, let's say since 1990s, maybe since 2000s, uh, we are starting to actually talk about data science uh, in terms of the amount of data we are getting from the scientific instruments, scientific simulations is so big that it's not only the design of experiments that's beyond the capability of a kind of unaided human mind, but it's also the creation of new hypotheses that's something that we cannot do anymore. That today we need to use something like data mining in order to come up with new possible models for, for our world. I think that that's kind of an interesting way of, of thinking about how our way of thinking about the, the world has, has evolved. Uh, and now maybe to switch a little bit into the pitfalls of, of doing data mining. So one important thing is what is called von Ferroni's principle. Uh, and that guy said that if you look harder than the quantity of data supports, you will find some kind of pattern that fits. And this is one of the main uh, challenges with, with doing data mining. We are working with models which are so complex and so expressive that uh, you can all, basically always find a model that fits whatever data you have. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean that the model is correct, just means that you have tried so many different things with, with today's computers, computational power and, and the uh, amount of tools that we have, we, we can do so many different tests that, that it's possible, almost always possible to find some kind of model that, that fits. So one of the challenges is that if you kind of go back to, to some of the let's say older sisters of, of data mining, for example, in statistics, uh, there are certain quite well understood limits on what kind of knowledge can you extract from a given amount of data. So you would know that if you have 100 data points, you cannot reliably fit anything bigger than, I don't know, maybe a level three polynomial or, or something like this. Uh, but we don't have similar, uh, similar rules for data mining. So in general, that there is a lot of people who are trying to use very complicated data mining methods with the amount of data which doesn't really support it. And part of the challenge is, of course, that uh, again, we don't really have easy guidelines on how complicated you can do it. But it's at least important to understand that this is uh, a party. This is a possible problem, uh, and kind of one. one but, but, but sorry, hmm? yes, one question. Hmm? Uh, do you mean that uh, there are methods, but they are very hard to understand? When you say it's hard to formalize, mm. or I think this again goes goes back to the kind of uh, art versus science question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think this, this is something that comes with experience. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know how to, how to teach those kinds of things. 
the, 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 I think this is very much an intuition thing. Uh, mm. Kind of just to give a little bit of, of examples of, of things like this. So there is this thing called Rhine paradox, and Rhine was an American scientist uh, who actually wanted to do parapsychology research using scientific method. So he has this hypothesis that some people had extrasensory perception, and he tried to validate this claim using scientific method. So in one of his experiments, he had a number of subjects who were supposed to guess symbols on 10 hidden cards. Each card was randomly chosen from five different possibilities. Uh, and his conclusion was that almost one person in 1,000 has ESP because they were able to get all 10 right. Uh, so he's done this experiment. He identified the people with ESP. Uh, and then basically, so he said, okay, Quite, quite interesting. Let's double check if it actually works. So Ryan told those guys that they had ESP and then please come back for another session. We want to double check things. Uh, and unfortunately for him, the, the results from the second test, they didn't, didn't really work out. The results were pretty much the expected number of random uh, correct guesses. So what was, what was the conclusion? Can you guess the conclusion that Ryan got? What do you think is the conclusion from, from this? I don't know, actually. <laughs> no, no idea? Hmm? He uh, manipulated his uh, data. <laughs> well, that's not what, what he concluded. Uh, he basically figured out that you actually shouldn't tell people that they have extrasensory <laughs> transaction because once you tell it to them, then they lose it. And on one level, sure, that's, that's a perfectly valid conclusion from this particular experiment, right? They had extrasensory perception until he told them about it. Uh, so that, that's one kind of example. If you would look for a, an explanation that explains what has been observed, that's a valid explanation that, that, that would work. But of course, it's not very convincing, right? That, that's not really what, what happens. Turns out that the actual design of the first experiment was, was flawed. The, it was possible to see enough of the information on, on those cards that people weren't really guessing at random. They, they got enough hints to, uh, to get much better than random results. The second experiment was much more, much more carefully designed. Uh, but the, the point here I wanted to make is that if you just look for an explanation of the data, you could end up with something like this. And for us, this particular conclusion is obviously not acceptable. But if you would try to have an automatic system, automatic system will, would not know that this, this conclusion doesn't make sense. Right? It does explain the data. So basically for any, any amount of data, you can always find an explanation which would explain this data, but not in a very, very good way. So that, that, that was just uh, one way of intuitively explaining this context, concept. And then, as, as we said, the, the main idea behind uh, data mining is to find interesting patterns. So the challenge is it's very, very difficult to really formalize the concept of interesting patterns. And I mean, Stefan will talk a little bit more about it in one of the next, next lectures. But one of the challenges is that if you look at data mining methods, they will usually generate a lot of patterns. And most of them will not be very interesting. So you need to have some way of filtering based on those interestingness measures. And there are several different ways of looking at it. Of course, for example, easily understood by humans is, is one interesting criterion. You would want the patterns to be easily to understood. Uh, you would want the patterns to be valid on the new data with some degree of certainty. You would want the patterns to be useful you would want them to be either novel, so something you didn't know 
or validating the hypothesis that you seek to confirm. So those are all examples of what kind of patterns you would be interested in. But again, all of those are uh, very kind of fuzzy definition. It's difficult to formalize them. There has been a lot of work put into trying to find different ways to formalize those kinds of concepts, but with, with some kind of limited success. So if you look at it from more scientific perspective, people have divided interestingness measures into two different, uh, two different types, the objective or subjective interestingness measures. Uh, so the objective ones are based on statistics and structures of data. And the examples would be things like support, confidence, accuracy, and, and so on. So those are basically the measures that you can get from the data itself. The problem with those is that they don't necessarily correspond to those, uh, uh, those uh, kind of criteria that we really would be interested in. Uh, and then the subjective measures are based in one way or another on user's belief. So here we could have uh, examples such as unexpectedness, novelty, actionability, all of those things which are much more interesting from, let's say, business perspective or from the perspective of actually getting something out of the data mining approaches. Uh, but they are much more difficult to kind of calculate and to put a number on and, and to actually compare different patterns. So this, this kind of duality is present in a lot of, uh, a lot of different uh, areas of data mining where you have on one hand the nice uh, formal ways of measuring things which are easy or at least possible to calculate but don't really correspond 100% to the goals of the user, uh, and you have the uh, kind of fuzzy subjective ways of looking at things which really capture user, user's interest, but where it's really difficult to, de to uh, objectively say if a particular method was successful or not based on those criteria. Uh, so a lot of uh, research and, and uh, kind of practical applications of data mining is trying to be somewhere in the middle, uh, taking a little bit of, of each uh, to make sure that you are getting both results which can be compared against other methods and results which you know will be useful uh, for the user. Uh, another challenge with data mining is how many different types of data you can be working with. Uh, and if you look at it, uh, one very popular way or type of data is data streams and, and sensor data. So anytime you have anything measured, you would collect this as a time series data. Uh, you can have temporal data, sequence data, uh, this can be from sensors, it can be from different kinds of events, but anything that's, that's based on time. You can have structured data, especially today there is a lot of work on analyzing social network, uh, analyzing different kinds of linked data, graphs, relational databases. So basically data in which you have different entities with different kinds of relations between them. Uh, there are different kind of heterogeneous databases. So for example, multimedia uh, and finding patterns in images, videos, that's, that's a, uh, its own challenge. There is a lot of uh, data in, in text databases, the biggest one of course being the internet or World Wide Web. Uh, and if you try to do data on, on text or data mining on text, that comes with its own challenges. So a lot of what the data, so a lot of data mining is at least to some degree independent of the data type, but a lot of this is also specific. So you would have a number of algorithms that only target text data or only target image data and so on. Uh, and it's kind of important to understand uh, those, uh, those constraints. 
And on the other side, it's also, uh, as I mentioned, there is a lot of different patterns that you might be interested in discovering. So, for example, uh, one big question is, are you interested in precise or approximate patterns? Uh, so, in many cases, when you are trying to find uh, something that fits your data, you can find a precise pattern. So you can find a model which fits your data exactly. But also in many cases, if instead of this exact pattern you would use an approximate pattern, you could have something which is much more compact, much more easy to understand. And then it turns out that in many cases it will also generalize better. So there is a trade-off here about how precisely you want to fit your data and how much would you expect the uh, results to work in the future. Also, uh, the question is, do you want to find constraint or non-constraint patterns? So the idea being, do you want to specify what kind of patterns you want to find or do you want the uh, the data mining algorithm to work as a kind of black box thing where you don't need to specify anything that it will give you all the different kinds of patterns. Uh, and the challenge here is what is called the no free lunch theorem. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about that later, but it's basically that uh, if you know what you are looking for, if you want to, if, if you are able to add domain knowledge to the data mining process, then you will end up with generally much better results. But it's not very easy to combine data-driven and knowledge-driven approaches. Uh, in many cases, uh, or th there are many approaches which, which only consider data or which only consider domain knowledge, uh, while combining the two can sometimes be difficult. So there is a lot of quite interesting research on how to push the domain knowledge into the mining process. Uh, so all of those things are important okay, when you start thinking about what kind of data mining methods you would want to be using. So if you think of the, of the modeling for, for data mining, this always has kind of two stages. So you start by using some kind of data, usually historical data, to create a model. Uh, and then once you have your model, you want to use it on new data in the future to actually get some kind of benefit from it. Right? So if we look at uh, supervised machine learning, so what we have is we have the historical data of some examples, and we know that each example belongs to a predefined class. So for example, we want to be working with images. We might have some images, and we, have, we know that there we have 1,000 images of cats, and we have 1,000 images of dogs, and we want to learn to distinguish cats from dogs. Or it could be uh, in kind, some kind of monitoring scenario. It could be uh, distinguishing between employees of a company and guests to figure out who should get access and who shouldn't, uh, whatever the, the classes could be. So given this kind of training data, we want to build a model. So it could be classification rules, could be decision trees, SVM, any, any kind of model to fit this data as well as possible. So to basically learn to what kind of features distinguish between dogs and cats. Uh, and then we would want to evaluate the accuracy of this model. So we want to know if our model actually works or not. Uh, and we want to try to do it on uh, some kind of independent set so that we don't overfit. Uh, so this is about model construction. So once we have done this work, then we know that we have, let's say, neural network, and we know that this neural network has accuracy of maybe 95% in distinguishing between cats and dogs. Uh, and then the next step is model exploitation. Once we have this network, we need to figure out how 
to use this in order to uh, uh, in order to draw conclusions about new examples. So we will be given a new image and the network will be able to tell us is it a cat or a dog? And then the question is uh, what will we do with this information? And then the, the question is how do we exploit this model based on things like the, the accuracy that we have gotten? Uh, of course if the accuracy is high, we can trust this model more. If the accuracy is low, we cannot trust it so much. Uh, so in what way we will be able to use it depends on, on things like that. Uh, it's also important to figure out for how long we expect this model to be valid. So cats and dogs maybe don't change so much, but if we would train other employees versus guests, at some point you would need to retrain because the list of employees of a company is not constant, that, that changes uh, from time to time. So it's important to understand that when you create such a model, that model doesn't necessarily need to stay valid forever. Uh, it might be that at some point you will need to recreate the model with some new data. Uh, and then if we look at what kind of tasks we would want to be able to solve with data mining. So we've talked about the predictive and descriptive tasks. So in predictive tasks, we would mostly talk about things like classification, regression, prediction. Uh, so we basically want to, for example, map the data into predefined classes. So we see a new image, we want to know if it's cat or dog. Uh, or in regression case, you would want to approximate the data with, with some function. So, for example, we would train the uh, stock market model, and then we would want to know what will be the price of a particular uh, stock, stock price uh, at a particular day, and so on. Uh, so, most often, you would do this kind of predictive uh, reasoning using supervised learning. So, you have some kind of training data, with examples of what you want to achieve. And this data would usually come from historical information, and then you would want to use this to predict the future. Uh, and the other way of doing things is the descriptive analysis. And in this case, it's usually unsupervised learning. So here, you wouldn't necessarily know the, uh, you wouldn't have the training data with, with some supervised labels. So here you would have tasks such as clustering. So, for a, so this would be about finding groups of similar items. Uh, you could have, uh, let's say, your customers from a supermarket, and you would want to say, find me five groups of, of five different types of customers. Uh, that would be the task. Or it could be association rules where you would find relationships between items. So what types of goods are usually bought together? Uh, you could have characterization task. So you would want to derive representative information. Uh, so you would want to say, what's, what, what are the most critical features for uh, heavy duty truck versus a bus uh, or, or any other uh, differentiating information? <clears throat> And then if, if you look at some, some examples of, of what, you, what you could do, I think that this, this will be quite, quite simple. So for classification and prediction, the goal is to focus on discriminating features. So you want to find what's different or what's separating the different classes. For example, if you have your customers and you want to segment them into uh, some kind of risk segments, you want to know what are the most critical differences between people who will pay off uh, their loan and people who will not pay it off? Uh, if you look at something like multidimensional concept description, you want to provide characterization of groups of data points. So you want to contrast different data characteristics. So let's say you have uh, different regions in a country and you want to say, what, what are the main differences between dry and wet regions of the country? 
well, obviously the amount of rain would be one, but you are interested in what else uh, makes makes a difference. You, you would want to find things like vegetation and, and different different kinds of uh, different ways in which you could describe the similarities and differences between them. Uh, you could look at co-occurrences. So the example of young men buying diapers and beer. Uh, and here it's especially important to understand that the correlation does not mean causation necessarily. Right? So uh, just because things are correlated doesn't mean that one of them is causing the other. Uh, more examples would be things like cluster analysis. So you want to group data into some kind of classes, uh, basically maximizing intra-class similarity, minimizing inter-class similarity. So you want to say that we have this group of, let's say, customers, and they are all very similar to each other, but quite different from all the other customers. Uh, you want to do outlier analysis. So finding objects which do not comply with the typical behavior. Uh, so you would say that, well, most customers uh, spend, I don't know, between 50 and 1,000 crowns when they visit supermarket, probably more than 1,000. And if somebody goes to a supermarket and buys something for one crown, that, that's an outlier, that, that, that's a strange thing. And then, of course, the question is, is this some kind of noise? Is it uh, uh, something, maybe the sensor was broken or whatever? Or is it actually an interesting exception that that's worth some kind of analysis? Uh, and that can be useful, for example, in things like fraud detection and, and so on. And then you want to also be doing different kinds of trend and uh, evolution analysis. So, for example, measure trend of different things, deviation from this trend, you want to measure periodicity, you want to find similarities between things. You can do sequential pattern mining, so different kinds of basket analysis. If I buy something today, what will I buy next week and what will I buy next month and so on. Uh, all of those kinds of approaches are uh, examples of, of data mining tasks. And I mean, I, I'm sure you can see now that one of the big challenges with, with data mining is that there is so many different tasks that in many cases it's hard to find similarities between those kinds of methods. Uh, so data mining as a, as a field is a very broad one with a lot of different algorithms which essentially solve different problems and the only thing they have in common is this idea of discovering new knowledge. But if you look at it somewhere kind of more uh, in a more abstract way, you basically, most of data mining at some level boils down to either supervised or unsupervised machine learning. So again, just to, just to kind of summarize, in case of supervised learning, if you think of classification, you have training data with target labels. You have new data, which is classified based on the patterns you have found in the training set. And because you have those train, those target labels, you want to focus only on the relevant information. So you only want to focus on the information that distinguishes between the two classes that you are looking for. Uh, and you can, you can evaluate results in an objective way using something like accuracy. In case of unsupervised learning, let's say clustering, because you don't have any labels in the data, the target task, what you are actually trying to do, is a little bit unspecified. It's, it's somewhat subjective what exactly you want to do. You want to discover some kind of structure that exists in this data, but it's very open-ended problem. So if you want to find clusters, you will take advantage of different kind of similarity measures defined between objects. But there might be different types of clusters or uh, different clusters depending on what you are interested in. Uh, and then if you compare classification and regression, so classification is when you have small number of target classes. So you want to distinguish between, let's say, cats and dogs. 
Uh, and regression is when you are trying to predict future values of a function, usually continuous function. So in a sense, both of those focus on the relation between one or more independent variables and the, some kind of dis response variable. But in classification, when you have categorical labels, what you are learning is the conditional probability. What's the probability of class S, class X, given the description Y? So basically, you want to focus on the differences between classes. While in regression, when you try to predict values of continuous function, uh, you are creating a, a more generative model, which focuses on the unknown values. So you basically learn the joint probability was the probability of x and y. Uh, so we will talk more about that in, in future lectures. But the most common, by far the most common way of doing machine learning is, is the supervised machine learning. So here the goal is to find patterns that explain or are associated with certain target labels. Uh, and one of the most common examples that the kind of toy examples of, of this is the iris data set. So you have different types of uh, iris flowers and they are described by different, uh, different features. So for example, petal width and petal length. And you can see that different, uh, different species of this flower uh, are different based on those parameters, but there is some kind of overlap between the red and blue ones, which makes it uh, a somewhat at least non-trivial task. So in supervised machine learning, you need a representative training set, and then you want to make predictions based on that. So you can use exactly the same techniques for the iris data set. You can use it for training, for example, a spam filter. So you would, uh, train it based on a list of important emails and everything else, and then the machine would be able to predict those things. Uh, but the challenge here, of course, is to make sure that the training set you have is really representative. Because if, if your training set is not really representative, if, if it, there is something special about it, and most of the data in the future will not look like it, uh, your model will not work, as, as you can see. And if you try to predict the trend of number of husbands uh, based on the wedding day, uh, you are likely to make quite a bit, quite a bit of mistake. Uh, and in unsupervised learning, on the other hand, it focuses on finding patterns in data. So the most common way of doing that is clustering. So in clustering, you would find different similar patterns in the data. And as I mentioned, the challenge with clustering is that this is uh, so subjective because you can try to cluster based on different, uh, different uh, criteria. If you look at, let, let's say, those, those characters, you can cluster them perfectly, reasonably, based on, on different criteria. The clustering of females versus males makes sense but the clustering of Simpsons family versus school employees, that also makes perfect sense. Another example of unsupervised machine learning would be anomaly detection, when you want to try to find things which don't match the general patterns and so on. Uh, and then when we talk about machine learning, we mostly talk about statistical machine learning. So we are looking for statistically significant patterns in the data. Uh, and we want to do it using algorithms and uh, uh, processing power of, of computers because obviously uh, there is a lot of different potential patterns you could look for. If you really want to make it, it will take quite a few computations. So what you basically do is you try to base those mo models on mathematical properties of the data and usually some kind, kind of noise models. So you assume that the data that you have, it corresponds to certain uh, properties of the, of the real world, but it's usually contaminated by some kind of noise. So you are trying to account for the noise 
and discover the, the real properties. Uh, so if you think of a learning problem as kind of what, what, what really you want to do, the goal is to improve a particular task with experience. And that means that in order to formalize it, you need to figure out what kind of task you are trying to solve, what kind of performance measure you are using, and what kind of experience information you have access to. Uh, so the other important thing is that the goal is generalization. So the good performance on unseen data. So the goal is of course not to be accurate on the training set, but to discover patterns from the training set that you expect to be applicable in the future as well. So if you look at the inductive learning example, uh, this can be about, you have some amount of data points, so it would be the dots here, and you want to find some kind of hypothesis or a function that agrees with those examples. Uh, and if a hypothesis perfectly agrees with this, if it's con then we call it consistent. So if the hypothesis is, uh, has exactly the same value as the target function f, then we would call it consistent. So here is one easy example. You have uh, seven different points, but they all lie on a line. So you would say that here, the hypothesis would be a single line. But of course, that's not the only possible hypothesis. You could also imagine that the same seven points could come from a very different function like the one here. There is no obvious reason why example A would be better than B. Both of those fit the data perfectly well. Uh, also, you could imagine like in, in example C, if you have data which is not on a line, now you can have two different possibilities. You could have the red line which fits the data perfectly but it's quite complex. Or you could say that you like the green line better, even though it doesn't fit the data so well, but it's very simple, it's, it's just a single line. Uh, or you could also say that this data actually comes from some kind of a sinusoid uh, function. So all of those examples are examples of different hypotheses that would explain to better or worse degree this particular data. And the underlying concept under all of the machine learning is that in order to achieve good generalization, you want to find the simplest consistent hypothesis or the simplest almost consistent hypothesis. So if we look at our examples here, the first one would be consistent linear fit. So that looks great. Uh, Example B would be consistent seventh order polynomial, but we would assume that linear feed is better because it's a simpler hypothesis. We prefer the polynomial of degree one over polynomial of degree seven. Uh, in example C, now we actually have a, have a choice to make because either we can pick an inconsistent linear feed, so a line which doesn't fit the data perfectly, but it fits okay, or we could pick a consistent six order polynomial. So uh, data which, or model which fits the data, but it's quite complex. So it's hard to say without knowing anything about the, the type of the problem we are trying to solve, which of those could potentially be better. And then in example D, we actually have a consistent sinusoidal fit. And then the question is, is sinusoid considered a simple model or a complicated model? If we expect from the domain knowledge that sinusoid is something that uh, makes sense, like if we are talking about, uh, I don't know, let's say something in, in electrical uh, grid, then sinusoid might be a perfectly good model and, and it makes sense. So that, that's the basic idea behind, uh, behind machine learning, that you want to find different kind of, uh, of hypothesis that matches your data to some degree. Uh, 
I will have to speed up through through a couple of slides here where, where maybe we don't need to go into, into all of the details. So here the idea was that the data was represented as, as kind of points in, uh, in space, but often the data is also represented as just kind of a table. So we could have here six different attributes uh, and we are trying to figure out if the person will enjoy sport or not based on the values of those attributes. Uh, and then in here again, the hypothesis was represented as a function. This was just a continuous function of one variable. Here, we would want to represent our hypothesis as some kind of a rule. So we could say that we put constraints on our attributes. So we can have either a specific value for the attribute or we could have a don't care. So one possible hypothesis would be like this. If it's sunny and wind is strong and forecast is the same, then we will either enjoy sport or not. We don't care about the values of the other attributes. So this is one way of, of representing a hypothesis. If we have a hypothesis like that, we can classify an example it will tell us if we will enjoy sports or not. Uh, and the interesting thing is that you can have a, a ordering of hypotheses from general to specific that corresponds to different sets of instances. So every hypothesis, and here we are just talking about the binary task, so the, ans the answer is always either yes or no. So any hypothesis corresponds to a set of instances or examples for which this hypothesis returns true or false. And that means that you get a, a, a lattice of hypotheses, a grid of hypotheses, where you can say that one hypothesis is more general or more specific than the other because it will cover the same examples. But you can also end up with hypotheses which are not comparable. So here, for example, hypothesis three is more general than uh, hypothesis two, but hypothesis three and one are incomparable. Uh, and then one idea of doing machine learning would be to just try to find the most specific hypothesis, which is consistent with all of our examples. But the challenge with doing something like this is that if we, if we only limit ourselves to the most specific hypothesis, we don't really know how well the concept has been learned. Have we been, do, do we need more training examples? Maybe we haven't been able to narrow down well enough. We also cannot tell if the training data is inconsistent because we are just ignoring all the negative examples. And then we decided to pick a maximally specific hypothesis, but there is no immediate reason to believe that this is better than any other hypothesis. Maybe we can find some other hypothesis. So what we could also do is we could try to find what is called version spaces. So all the hypotheses which are consistent with our training data. So again, we've, we've talked consistent hypothesis is one which agrees with target on all the examples. And then a version space would be uh, a set of all the hypotheses which are consistent with our training data. Uh, and if we think about this, this or such a set of hypotheses, you actually don't need to list all of them because it's enough to uh, think about what's the most specific and the most general hypothesis in this set. And you can represent the whole set using just those two. Uh, and I will skip this thing. So basically the underlying idea behind uh, machine learning is this concept of IID data, which stands for ident independent and identically distributed. So what we basically assume is that there exists a single underlying true distribution of the data that we want to model. And then all of our training examples are drawn independently from it, which means that our data samples 
cannot be related to each other, and also that all the future data will come from exactly the same distribution, which means that our training and testing set will be done in similar setting. Uh, so there is a, an issue with this kind of assumption that, for example, in adversarial settings, uh, this leads to certain certain issues. And if we think of uh, uh, if we think of areas such as security or forensics or, or malware, uh, that can be that can be a challenge because if we assume that the testing and training data is comes from the same distribution, then we can learn once and we can base our predictions on what we have seen in the training data set. But if we assume that we have trained our system and then there is some kind of adversarial or enemy who can adapt their let, let's call it attacks to our to, to what we have learned so they can modify their behavior based on our trained model uh, that requires a, quite a different approach and, and most of the typical machine learning will not really work so you may have heard about the, this concept of deep learning, and one of the challenges with, with deep learning is that it's actually very, uh, it's quite easy to fold this into making mistakes. So one of the success stories behind deep learning was, of course, image recognition. So here you can see the example of uh, on the left hand side there's an image of panda and the uh, there, there have been several different uh, deep learning algorithms that are able to recognize images like this with reasonably high confidence so this one here would have 57.7 percent confidence that this image is actually a panda and that's great but the challenge is if you add to this panda a little bit of noise, so just the middle example doesn't seem to contain anything of interest. Uh, and in fact, if you combine the, the left image with this noise, you end up with the right hand image, which to a human eye looks exactly the same. We, we cannot really distinguish between the two images. But this image has been modified to a such degree that the same deep network now will answer that this is not a panda it's a gibbon with 99 percent confidence uh, so this is one example of uh, what can happen if you violate this iid uh, assumption because now this right hand image it actually is different from from the network's perspective uh, from the from the data it has trained on uh, and that's one of the one of the challenges uh, so to do this kind of, uh, to fool the network like this, mm -hmm. do you need to know uh, how the network is built or can you do it mm -hmm. in another way or do you need knowledge about the network? You need knowledge structure? about the network. So, so this one actually yeah. requires you to be able to, but not only the network structure, but the, the exact information about the weights and so on. So we need to be able to measure okay. gradients in different places. Mm -hmm. So another thing I wanted to mention uh, are, is, is this no free lunch theorem. Uh, so the idea here is basically that uh, it's, it's already Hume in uh, 1800s who said that in general, even after you have ob observed certain pattern, you don't necessarily have any reason to draw inference uh, about the future. Uh, and also that this kind of thing has been uh, has been formalized in, in several papers uh, about if we assume that all the different uh, target functions are equally likely then all the all the different learning algorithms will on average behave the same way 
so I will not go into too much details here, but you can also look at it from the more, uh, more mathematical perspective when you look at uh, the conditional probabilities. But the basic idea is that uh, just because we have observed certain amount of data without any a priori assumptions about what kind of functions we are trying to learn, we cannot make any predictions about the future. So the idea why all the machine learning algorithms work is because the interesting, uh, interesting patterns we are trying to predict, interesting functions, interesting behaviors in the world, uh, they all share certain uh, common characteristics. So all of the machine learning algorithms introduce what is called a bias. So they make certain assumptions beyond just the data that they are observing and the actual uh, quality of the solution you are getting depends on how well does the internal uh, assumption embedded into the machine learning algorithm actually fit a particular task in which you are using it. Uh, so this is an important thing to, to understand that most of the success of machine learning is about finding the right algorithm for the particular task. And again, the challenge here is that we don't really have good formal ways of doing it. That's, that again, kind of boils down to the, uh, boils down to the uh, more of an intuition of whoever is doing the, the data mining. Uh, and that also boils down to kind of, or kind of comes back to what is like, what, what would be the best uh, machine learning algorithm and so on. And why there are so many different machine learning algorithms and nobody can agree on which one is the best. Uh, and there is some, some interesting thing here, for example, in the International Conference on Data Mining in 2006, they've done a survey of uh, what are the top 10 algorithms. And here is the list of this. And surprisingly enough, they have never done this survey again after that. Uh, even though the paper that reports those results has 3,700 citations. So obviously that's a very important thing to have. People like to have lists like this, but the uh, kind of controversy around this, that was, it was so, uh, so controversial that this idea that they haven't done it on any of the future conferences. I mean, uh, to me, it sounds, <laughs> sounds quite interesting, uh, but it, it's just something, something to think about. Uh, and I think we are running out of time, so I will not, I have a couple of kind of uh, finishing. In, in, what, in what way was it controversial? Uh, well, a number of people didn't like the final ranking. You know, all, all of those algorithms and probably some of those which are missing here have uh, very vocal uh, proponents. Uh, mm -hmm. So, to More be honest... Politics and uh, gaming. Yeah, probably. I mean, I'm very yeah. surprised that this has not been done after that. I would really expect this to, to be done more often. And the only reason I can, I can imagine is because people were uh, upset about the, the results here. Uh, I think that, that is quite interesting. But, I mean, it's also, uh, would it be some, mm -hmm. depending on, I guess these different algorithms are available for download or similar that you have a list of how many people have downloaded each and every version. Uh, so th those are just the votes from, from the conference. But yes, all of those algorithms are available. Uh, most of them are available in, in a lot of different, uh, different libraries or tools uh, and, and so on. So yeah. those are all very popular algorithms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I think I will just finish here. 
So that was the, the introductory lecture. Uh, and then I guess in two weeks, uh, we will talk more about uh, specifically the decision tree uh, learning algorithms. Uh, any questions, final comments?